Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly readings and homily for Trinity Sunday. Trinity Sunday comes at the end of um, a very important sequence in the church year that begins with Advent. It takes us all the way from the birth of Christ through the Passion narrative, then through the Eastertide season, then Pentecost, and now finally this great culmination, Trinity Sunday, when the church celebrates the three ways in which God has revealed God's self and operates within the world. <clears throat> we see God as creator, redeemer, and sustainer in the three persons of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I think you'll see that in the readings today. Let's begin with a long reading from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God said, And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth to bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps along the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our own image, according to our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. 
and every be and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth everything that has breath of life i have given every green plant for food and it was so god saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude our epistle reading this week comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the very familiar passage in Matthew chapter 28, often called the Great Commission. Now when the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, they saw him and they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey everybody. Welcome to Trinity Sunday in 2020, which is yet another one of these church observances that seems so completely different this year since we're not together. Many of our events this spring, our Easter our Pentecost, and now our Trinity Sunday have been different. I was thinking this week uh, about that brief little passage that we read today in Second, uh, Second Corinthians, uh, greet each other with a holy kiss. Can you think of a more inappropriate commandment uh, in today's climate than to greet each other with a holy kiss? And so if I was going to be super cutesy, I would name today's sermon uh, Kissing in the Age of Quarantine or something like that, but I won't bore you with those kind of uh, shenanigans. But I was thinking about just how Trinity Sunday can look for us this year and maybe some things that are new for us this year uh, and how we can appreciate the power and glory of Trinity Sunday uh, a little differently in 2020. So remember, the Trinity is a concept that is not clearly expressed in Scripture. The word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. But it's an idea that grew out of the disciples' experiences with Jesus and with later generations' interpretations of the whole of Scripture, especially in Matthew 28 when Jesus says to go out and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And also, in our Second Corinthians passage, where we see the three persons of the Trinity active in the life of the church. So, why then has the Trinity been such a contentious idea over the history of the church? you might not be aware of, nor might you care about the long and minute uh, details of the church. But the Trinity has been one of those really sticky subjects for the last 2,000 years in the church. People have fought over it. People have left church organizations over it. And even today, the Trinity seems to be one of those um, watershed theological uh, ideas that say whether or not you really are a Christian. Yeah, I'm not really sure about that. But I do know that when we sit and try to think about the Trinity, 
our minds usually get tied into all sorts of knots. Uh, I think I've told you the story. Uh, my first Trinity Sunday, uh, when I was preaching in Texas, uh, I happened to have in the congregation that day uh, my professor, Dr. Olson, and um, afterwards he came through the receiving line uh, when uh, everybody's leaving and you're shaking hands and everybody's giving you those little you know, two-second critiques of the service, you know, the music was too loud or things like that. And Dr. Olson came by and he shook my hand and he looked up at me and he said, well, the Trinity is notoriously difficult to preach on. And he walked out and I about crumbled into a little pile of ashes right then. And he's right. Uh, we can barely think clearly about the Trinity, let alone preach clearly about the Trinity. So on today, I want you to think about with me the Trinity in our regular life, the Trinity in the age of coronavirus, the Trinity in the age of this quarantine. We see and experience the three persons of God all the time. We do not worship three gods, nor do we worship a team of gods. Rather, we worship the one God who operates and has made God's self known in three major ways. The first we're very familiar with in the creation. I've had more time to dwell on nature and the creation around me over the last few months than I have probably in my entire life. I have been on more walks, I have listened to more birds, I have picked on more squirrels, I have done all sorts of things out in the world. I hope you have too. It's easy to see our Creator God at work. Creation that began so long ago and still goes on to this very day. Every time you hear a new bird singing, every time we see the leaves bursting out of the dead limbs of winter. Every time we see something growing, we see the Creator God. Also, don't forget, whenever we see something dying, we see the Creator God. A God who not only creates a world where there is new growth and new life, but a world where death is a very real thing. It might be an unnecessarily painful thing, but where death is very real. You see, we often sugarcoat the Creator God by saying, oh, the Genesis passage is so beautiful and uh, diverse and vivid, and oh, we turn it into a child's story. But it carries with us into our adult lives, and it carries with us into every day. God as Creator is the God who creates people even after they're already grown. We worship a God whose relentless pursuit of creation doesn't stop at the end of Genesis chapter 1. Our Creator God carries us through every new trial and new experience. I've had to be creative myself as I tried to figure out how to entertain my girls during this quarantine. We've had to be creative in how to come up with new ways to have church. The whole world has had to be creative in ways to help our neighbors survive as the economy has changed. Who are we to think that the God of the universe, the great creator God, isn't at work currently too? It is a beautiful mirror of God's creative energy when we ourselves are faced with new challenges that make us creative, that make us find solutions to our problems, that make us, for no other reason than for the pure joy of doing it, making something new. When Jesus is telling his disciples about his work, he says, Behold, I make all things new. 
He wasn't talking about starting over, a great flood or a great fire or a great cataclysm that would wipe all the living things off the earth and start fresh. No, he was talking to people who already had years and years of experiences in life, of dreams and disappointments. And he could look those disciples in the eye and say, I can still make things new. Oh, what a powerful idea to know that our God is still creating us, is still working with and through us, not in the cold static pages of Genesis 1 and 2, but in the very real messy moments of 2020. Our Creator God is not quite done creating. Our Sustainer, the Holy Spirit, the one we've been speaking of the most recently with uh, Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit, I think helps in that creative activity because there's more to us than just what we make with our hands or speak with our words. The Holy Spirit works within us. It helps organize, motivate, comfort, and inform our souls. The Holy Spirit is just as creative as the Father in the Trinity, but the Holy Spirit is the one we think of in our day-to-day -day encounters in those quiet, solitary moments when we're thinking about something we've read or something we're troubled by, and in those interactions that are six feet apart with a mask on, and you're trying to figure out, is that person smiling at me? I can't quite see their eyes moving. Did they say hello? <laughs> the Holy Spirit is at work in all the diverse encounters and interactions we have at the grocery and in these strange uh, new rituals we have of walking along the streets, of speaking to one another, of trying to make sure we're all okay. The Holy Spirit is alive in us, both working internally within our souls and externally in the way in which we conduct ourselves to others. That also is an aspect of the Creator God as we create new relationships, as we find new parts of ourselves that we did not know were there, as we find new depths of faith and trust in God. And of course, the Redeemer. Because the creation isn't going as well as we had hoped. These are tough times. We need the Creator, to keep building up the good and the right and the true and the beautiful. And we need the Sustainer to get us through these trying times. But at the heart of who God is, and in the heart of these days, is God the Redeemer, who can take that same passion and energy of creation and who can take the same love and comfort of, sus of sustenance in our spirits and can change the world and redeem it for God's own self. That's what's been on my mind and my heart the most this week. Maybe not so much the redemption of a particular soul, but on the redemption of an entire world. On Trinity Sunday, we can look out our windows and see all three aspects of our God. We can see God as creator. We can feel the comfort of God, our sustainer. And if you look out like I do, you might just see our need for God, the Redeemer. That's what the church counted on and was committed to. That same church that we read the end of that letter in 2 Corinthians today. You see, that church was in the midst of turmoil too. 
certainly different ter turmoil than what we experience. But they looked out their window and they saw a world that had been created by their God. They fellowshiped with one another through the spirit of their God. And they looked out and I think they had hope, much like we should today, that their Redeemer God could and would make a difference in the world around them. And so the blessing to them was, greet each other with a holy kiss. A symbol of camaraderie and fellowship and also a reminder that there's more going on here than just a gathering of souls. There's more going on here than just people worshiping God. God is still working in the acts of creation, in those ways we sustain ourselves and our neighbor. And thanks be to God in the acts of redeeming a broken world. So we might not be able to greet each other with a holy kiss for the foreseeable future. But my friends, may that little bit of irony remind us that all three persons of our Trinity God are still working today. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now, may God bless you and keep you. May God cause His countenance to rise upon you. May God cause His face to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen.